morning and welcome to worship this morning. Uh, and I want to thank Barb Johnson for putting together the announcements. And so if you have any announcements for uh, the church or for anything that we, that we appreciate knowing, please contact Barb or Penny and we'll make sure that we get these announcements read Sunday morning. We'd like to welcome our visiting speaker today, and Larry Jocelyn is from the Living Waters Rescue Mission. This has been a mission project for us for many years, and we're very thankful that Larry is going to speak with us this morning. There's going to be a mission meeting tomorrow afternoon at 5.30, so we will uh, just meet in the basement. Does, uh, or we'll figure it out. The basement are upstairs. It doesn't really matter. Um, now there's opportunities to sign up for a liturgist on the clipboard in the back. Uh, this is an important part of our worship. Um, and as of next Sunday, we don't have a liturgist. So please, and you know if I can do it, you can do it. Um, Thanks to all that have helped before, and please continue to sign up. I also want to tell you, there's also another clipboard. Uh, last Sunday, uh, Brock Manley came to our truck, and he's had a tray of donuts. He said, these are COVID-free donuts, so we need some new traditions in this church in this crazy time. So we are going to start having donuts after church. They're going to be at both doorways. And a um, little housekeeping issue, I've got little class, little wax bags in the dining room there, and there'll be gloves. Just put the donuts in the bags, put them back in the box, put the box, divide them up between each door. When you're leaving, pick up a donut, because we think of this time as being our Thanksgiving meal. And then when you go home in the afternoon, then you have a leftover. <laughs> You'll be able to appreciate a little snack on behalf of your church. Anyways, uh, there's also, uh, in the back, there's the little sign, not the signs, but there's the handouts for the Hamilton, oh golly, what is this one called? The Community Backpack Program. Can, it's called the Community Backpack Program? It's, um, it's through Marilyn Verona, and it's uh, putting together supplies for school students. And there's some back there if you signed up for it, but I'm sure Penny, uh, if she knows that they need some more volunteers to do that, it's there. And also now, um, the Can Caravan is going to be Tuesday, August 4th. And you can, your donations to the church on that day will be appreciated. Of course, we have that little tiny fun little competition with the S and FCC on who brings the most. And so we'll, I'm sure we'll continue to do that. And then also in the basement there are dishes that were removed from the cupboards that they were older dishes that had the uh, porcelain glazing had broken. And so it was misspoke last week. We're not going to throw them away if we don't get rid of them. We're going to uh, give them to the goodwill so that as part of being a Christian, it's if you can't do something, you pass it on to somebody that can. But they are downstairs. And if you want a memento from uh, what was in the kitchen, feel free to take one. And and that's all the announcements I have. Does anybody have any other announcements they'd like to share? Now, if we will get in the attitude of prayer to begin our worship with the opening <coughs> prayer. Summer is just about half over. Some of us have been able to travel, to spend special time with family and friends, but for others, there is a sameness that, about this season. It brings pressures to work to provide for our families. It reminds us of all the people who are ill and who are unable to enjoy some of the special delights that this season is supposed to bring. This morning, we take a few minutes to name our dear ones and situations of pain and loss as we ask for prayers from this congregation. Some people will remain unnamed because of the anguish we feel about their difficulties. But you are with them every step of the way, even when you don't feel like you, even when they don't feel like you care. You are there with them, offering them peace and hope. Let us turn our hearts to you as we silently offer these special people to your care.
Lord, you have heard the cries of our hearts. You see our tears and feel our pain. Be with us all. Give us healing for our broken spirits and bodies. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus, the Master Healer. Amen. Our first hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness, and we're going to sing the first and the last verse. If we say that we have no sin, 
we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Please join me in the prayer of confession. We are such a ragtag group of people. Some of us are at the top of our game, and others just struggle to get through each day. Yet you draw us here, where we find friendship, peace, and hope, not only for our lives right now, but for the time to come. Stand us up again, O God, dust us off, and put us back on pathways, service, and reconciliation. Warm our hearts to your love. Lift our spirits with your power. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Great news has come to us, dear friends. God, who is faithful and just, who cherishes us as we are, seeks restoration and healing for those broken places in our lives, forgives and loves us unconditionally, Receive that good news. turn this around and I want you to start waving so that way everybody on TV and back home can see. <laughs> Say howdy neighbor. Hey neighbor. <laughs> I'll make them sick probably in the process if I move it too fast. <laughs> Okay. Well, today, Brock and the kids didn't show up. I told them I was going to have a magic trick, and then they didn't make it. So, I've asked our wonderful liturgist if she would help me today. Since Larry got to do it at the other place, I'll let her do it. Okay, so I have magical straws from Culver's, so you can pick one. All right, so that's the one we're going to use. You can throw those back on the, on the seat. And now your job's done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to open this up. And this straw is going to represent the Holy Spirit. And the string, which ha actually happens to be my husband's shoestring from his work boots, I said he didn't like it when I do this trick because he gets nervous every time. Anyway, this, this shoestring, that is my robe, is going to um, represent kind of our relationship with God, okay? So what the enemy likes us to think is that we could be torn apart. There can be a broken line of communication. And Larry's come today, and he's from Living Water, and he works with people all the time like this, whose lives have become just, you know, they become disheveled, and they've bought in the lie that the love of God can be broken, that they're worthless, that they can never be made whole again. Maybe they've done something so bad in their life that they think there is no way possible that God could ever love them again or restore them. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever had a spot in your life where you thought that it was just too hard to say I'm sorry and come back to God? Because how could God ever love you when you've drifted so far? Well, see, the neat thing is we serve a God who is a God that can restore 
all things, no matter how bad, and make us whole again. Because the love of God is so deep and so strong, there is nothing we could ever do that could make us his son, who died on that cross, turn his back on us. Even the thief who stood there, I didn't stand there, he was hanging there on the cross, said, remember me. And Jesus says, I tell you truly today, you will be with me in paradise. Take that home. That no matter how bad life gets, no matter how far we stray from God, the lines of his love and communication are never broken. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for that reminder. We thank you for your love. We thank you for a love that will not let us go. We thank you for grace and mercy that goes to the ends of the earth and back, even to the cross, to save us. And with that, I will turn this over to Larry. Well, thank you so much. You can go up there if you would like. There is a microphone. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me here this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to meet people and to talk about the ministry of Living Water Rescue Mission. God has done a lot in the lives of men, women, boys and girls at Living Water Rescue Mission and Columbus also. Um, we are the same organization. It's the Columbus and Living Water Rescue Mission. Living Water Rescue Mission is in York. And with that, uh, I would like to pray for my time with you that uh, it will be fruitful and I will communicate God's message well about the work of rescue. Lord, thank you for just the opportunity <coughs> to share uh, what you're doing in our midst. And Lord, I know that each person here has a calling in their life that you have called them to of some kind. And Lord, I pray that each of us would be able to fulfill that calling according to your will and purpose. Thank you for your grace, your mercy your love, your compassion that never fails. Thank you for your faithfulness that never fails. And thank you for your love that never fails. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reminded of a passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 38, from what you were sharing this morning, which says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Powerful message to believers. Uh, I was listening to, I believe it was Derek, what's what, Thomas, Derek Thomas with Ligonier Ministries. And he was talking about Romans 8, 38 and 39 being a fortress that we can run into. And he talked about the love that God has for us from Romans 8, 28 also being a part of that fortress or really being the fortress that we can run into that no matter what, He's there. There is a shelter. There is a place. And a Living Water Rescue Mission, we seek to be that kind of a place. That people who have become weary, who have reached perhaps the end of themselves and come to a place where they need help. They know they need help now. And they come running back to the Lord. And we're there to be the arms of the Lord, welcoming them in. Galatians chapter 6 actually is, I think, the foundation of rescue ministry. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? That we love one another as he has loved us. 
So when we're bearing the burdens of others, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. And this is exactly what God has called us all to do. And at Living Water Rescue Mission, Columbus and Living Water Rescue Mission, that's our calling to be there always for those who need to return to the Lord or have never come to the Lord and need to hear the gospel. That's our commitment is to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe very firmly in what the scripture says. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of that sin is death, which means eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because God so loved the world, according to John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think what Peter said to those, some of the very ones that were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ, he looked to them, and after telling them, you crucified him, then says to those very people, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out in times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And we're there to offer that refreshing message. And then when someone comes to Christ or returns to Christ after being separated or feeling like they were broken, fellowship with God, but God showing his faithfulness has drawn them back us, when we see that happen, we're called to restore them, to bear their burdens. Because John 1.12 said, as many as received him, to them gave he the privilege, I'm going to call it, the right to be called the children of God. That's our message, and that's our fullest commitment. That's one reason why we never accept government funding. Because if we did, we wouldn't be able to be committed to that message. But Galatians 6, telling us that we are to restore those who have been caught in a trespass. Now, when we think of caught, we think of someone running away and they get caught. That's really not what's taking place here. It's talking about being snared or being caught, as it were, by transgressions. Things that grab a hold of their lives. And I think one of the most powerful illustrations I've ever given for that is a true story. Something that happened in Bakersfield, California. This is back in about 1984, 85. And we were serving at Bakersfield Rescue Mission in Bakersfield, California, which is Central California. And I was director of the inner city youth ministries there. And there was a man who came into the mission. And I was also involved in the ministry there in the, with to the men. But we had this man come into the mission for a meal, and he decided he wanted to come into the discipleship program. And he had this tumor on his head, which was starting to grow rather large. And so we told him, he had, before he could come in, he had to agree to go to the doctor and have that checked to see what needs to be done. So we took him in, the doctor said, you know what, real simple, just an outpatient, you'll, you'll be in and out the same day, and, and very simple procedure. And so the appointment was set, and on the night before the appointment, he slipped out in the middle of the night so he wouldn't have to deal with what was going on there. He did not want to deal with it, which is so unfortunate. Well, about two years later, I came driving into the mission, coming into work, and there was a man sitting out there, and he had a grapefruit on his forehead. And I thought, that is really strange, but I pulled up, and I've seen a lot of strange things over the years. And I pulled up and went on inside, and then when lunchtime came, and all the people from the street were coming in to eat the meal, he came walking in with this grapefruit on his forehead. And it became clear at that point that this was not a grapefruit, this was a tumor. This was the gentleman who a couple of years earlier didn't want to deal with it. At this point, once again, we wanted to help him. And so we told him that in order for him to keep coming there to eat, 
I don't know if we would have enforced it, but we wanted to get him to get help. We told him that he would have to go to the doctor and, and get this checked out. So we went to the doctor, we took him to the doctor, and the doctor saw this and said, wow, this thing now has its own vascular system, its own nervous system, this is a part of you now. And it's going to be a life-threatening surgery to take this, but it's going to take your life if we don't. So once again, we set him up for an appointment to get this dealt with, this now life-threatening surgery. And that evening, the evening before he was supposed to go in for that surgery, he slipped out in the middle of the night once again. This thing had become so much a part of who he was that he was owned by it, in a sense. Sin is like that. Sin can come to own us. Whenever I think of the word sins, I like to put an apostrophe there. Because my name is Larry, but if something belongs to me, that means it's Larry's, right? Well, sin is much like that. Sins... People can become, as it were, owned by their sin. And we see this in rescue mission work all the time. People will come in. I've seen people come in when they're a little younger and, and they're still fairly healthy and it's a great time to deal with it and they choose not to. See them a few years later and they try it again and they just decide they don't want to deal with it and they move on. And I've been doing this a long time, and 20 years in Washington. And so I've seen people progressively grow worse and worse, just like this man with his tumor. And I don't know what ever happened to him. But I pray that God finally got him to take care of that, but more than anything else, that God restored him. That's what we're called to do, is restore anyone who's caught in a trespass, anyone who has become owned by their sins, it's our calling to be God's tools of restoration, that he would work through us and that he would work by his spirit through them, changing, shaping, and molding them into the people of God he wants them to be. Because that's our calling, we have programs. Now, I hesitate to use the word programs because much of the time when we think of programs, we start getting a little uh, on the sense of, well, it's something we're doing, but it's really our not, not something we're doing. We're doing things. We, have, we make our plans, but God directs our steps, right? And so we make our plans, and these are our plans, our programs, and we let God work through those things then. So I just want to share with you the services that we have at Columbus and Living Water Rescue Mission. I'm going to start in the middle of the brochure this time, right in the very middle, because this is really the heart of the ministry. Everything we do is in an effort to bring people to become that we would preach the gospel and that they would become disciples of Jesus Christ. They would become those who are learning learners of Jesus Christ that they are seeking God and that he is teaching them and they are a learner, a student of Jesus Christ. So our purpose, <clears throat> the New Life Healing, or the New Life program is what we call the men's program in Columbus, and Healing Heart program, which we have in York. The New Life and Healing Heart programs are non-denominational Christian discipleship programs bringing God's healing and heart transformation. We do not look for conformity, although we need people to follow rules and that sort of thing. What we're, not, we're not looking for conformity. We're looking for transformation. That they would not be conformed to this world any longer, but that they would be transformed by the renewing of their minds. And that's our purpose. That's what we seek to do, is see that heart transformation. The programs are designed to be completed in actually as little as one year. We've gone up to one year because we added a mandatory uh, transitional program to it. We saw that too many people, when they would leave, they weren't really prepared. They would complete the nine-month program and they'd run right home or run out and uh, then they would end up stumbling. And so we need to work them through that process of trans uh, uh, transitioning out of the ministry. 
And so it's a one-year program, nine months of discipleship classes and uh, a, a very intensive effort to teach them the Word of God, to work them through, to help them process through. One of the things I'm always telling the ladies when I teach my classes is you are in a process. And so we want them to follow that process. We want them to process the things in their life. And there is a process in that that God is doing something in their lives and shaping and molding them. So that's our nine months. Then we have, they're not finished. In fact, I don't think any of us are finished, are we? <laughs> They're not finished, but they've started to become disciples. They have become disciples, and now they're carrying on as disciples of Christ Jesus. And therefore, we want them to transition into a life that is a continued life of growth. And so for three months, they'll be required, or they are required, to stay with us, to find work, save money, continue to attend our morning devotions and chapel services, whatever they can attend, that they're required to still come to those things, anything that will fit within their work schedule. And so we seek to continue to disciple them and help them as they transition into independent living. And so that's the one year you know, program that we have. We use Bible and biblically sound textbooks and media Bible lessons and life civil classes. I was a licensed chemical dependency counselor in Washington State, so I teach some chemical dependency classes for them. Obviously built around the Word of God, uh, even those chemical dependency classes. There's scriptural memorization, and that's a very dynamic part of discipleship for these folks is to memorize. Scripture. I know that's very important for me to have those scriptures kind of hidden in my heart, as David said. He said, Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so we need to have them experiencing the power of having the word of God hidden in their hearts. They're required to go to church every Sunday and become actively involved in their church. We've had different ones who have come in and become part of the worship team or teaching Sunday school and other parts of the ministry that they become a part of in serving in their local church. And that's a requirement because how are they going to continue on when they leave us and after they complete their transition, how are they going to continue on if they don't have folks like you around them to lift them up and build them up and the biblical teaching that they need. They're required to serve. Uh, they're, they're actively engaged in the ministry, operation of the mission, household and hospitality services. And so they're, they're, without them, we actually would really have a hard time running the ministry because they do the, the meals, they serve, they do a lot of different things. And so we really need them to do that, but it's also important for them to learn to have that servant's heart and do that humbly. And faithfully. I remember one of the ladies who was, we get donations from Starbucks. And I love the Starbucks sandwiches, by the way. Uh, and we get those and we fix them for meals. And there was one of the ladies who would come in the morning for breakfast. She'd come just barely awake. And she would go in and she would put the sandwiches in the window. And they could just microwave them themselves. And so in one of the devotions, I started talking about serving the Lord, and I didn't point her out, but I said, we should do our very best. That we shouldn't give our least, we should give our best. And that when we serve those who come into the mission, we should really pour our hearts into it. And I was so blessed, the next time I saw her, she had those sandwiches out of the wrappers and on cookie sheets and baking them in the oven, where they're really good. <laughs> And so that's the kind of thing that we want to see happen. We want to see a transformation. I didn't want to just tell her, you're doing a terrible job serving these people. You need to start cooking sandwiches right. I didn't do that. Instead, I instructed her and gave her corrective words from the Word of God, what she was to do. She changed in that process. So that's a very important part that they do share in the ministry. We also offer counseling. 
We have regular time spending with them, but we also have times where they just come into our office and say, I'm done. Can't tell you how many times I've heard that. I'm done. And we sit down and we process it, we work it through, and we see them. They're not really done. They just feel done at the moment. And so there's a lot of those uh, crisis management type counseling uh, opportunities we have, and I think those are the most important and the most those are actually uh, the most effective when there's something really tangible going on with them and they're upset about it and we can walk them through that. We have an overnight guest services program and this is for men or women. Now our discipleship program in York is just for women. Our discipleship program in Columbus is just for men. But in both locations, we have what we call guest services, which is for both men and women that we have at both facilities for them. And they can come in and they can have three weeks to find a job. We require four job applications a day and they have three weeks to find a job. And believe me, if someone wants a job, they can find one. Uh, it, there's something really special about our communities here in Nebraska, it's easy to find work and people are willing to take a chance on, on these folks. And so they find work within that three week period and then they have up to three months to stay with us, save money, continue to work, and then they can move out into their independent living. And so we still have accountabilities, we still require uh, chapel services and that sort of thing from them, but they're able to go out and work full time and get transitioned on. Sometimes it doesn't work well for them. They get a job, they get out on their own, and then a few months later, they're back with us. And it's at that time that we're hoping that they come into discipleship. So that restoration process can continue with them. And so the guest services program, again, is designed to preach the gospel and to be God's instruments of a transformed life that they can begin to grow in Christ, and we want to help them to do that. Whatever that takes, sometimes, like I said, it doesn't work right away. Sometimes they come back to us, and they end up coming into discipleship, and we love it when that happens. That's always our goal in whatever we do. We also have a pantry that we can, people from the community can come in, and they sit through a chapel service, 30-minute chapel service, and after the chapel service, or during the chapel service, 30 minutes, we fix them a big box of groceries and they can take it home to their families. And during this whole COVID outbreak, the numbers of people coming for food boxes has gone up uh, because there's a lot of people that are struggling out there. And so they still come in. During COVID, I might want to mention, we didn't require the chapel service because we weren't able to do chapel services. We had just restarted those. And so we didn't require that. If somebody needed food, we would just give it to them. We'd always give them a Bible and a track. And we've got some videos that we were giving them, uh, some Christian videos to watch. And so, uh, again, the goal is always to promote or to, I don't like the word promote. The goal is to always declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that happens through uh, the pantry and through the meals where people can come off. You know, we have three meals a day. People can come from the streets or from their job or sometimes from the community and have a meal with us three times a week. We were giving them uh, to-go boxes, but we've actually opened up our dining rooms again, and so we're letting them come inside instead of giving them the to-go boxes. We have a jail ministry, which for different, uh, well, we're in the counties of Platte, York, Butler, Polk, Merrick, Seward, and Boone counties, plus officers in the surrounding counties in states of serenity. Uh, SOS is a program that's in uh, Columbus that our ladies go to uh, once a month and they share the gospel there. And we've got disciples that come to the mission for our program from there. And so we have also aftercare for those who have uh, come out of the, the prisons. We can give them an opportunity through the guest services program and we can give them what they need and help them to um, build a new life. And so, and again, all of that is built around declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
one of the things that I've been blessed by uh, in Nebraska since we've been here is the support from the community. We have, over the years, how, uh, furnished complete households. You know, we're not, not able to do that anymore. We had to give up our warehouse, and hopefully we'll have another one sometime. In fact, we've got a building plan going on for one right now. But we're still giving out clothes. My wife, Kathy, uh, and the disciples actually have to roll everything out into the lot uh, behind the mission, and that's where we do our clothing distribution now. Uh, to get them out into the open and, and instead of trying to do it. We were, sometimes when it's rainy or something or too windy, we have to roll them out in the hallways. It's very close quarters and that's really not best. We, so we've been doing that outside. But we are in the process of uh, raising funds to build a building. Clothing distribution center, we're going to call it. And so we give out a lot of clothing. We give out those food boxes, by the way. We gave out about 200 of those last year to different ones in the community. And so, as with everything that we give out, it's free of charge. Again, the support that we get from the community, the food that we're able to put in those food boxes, uh, not only from uh, businesses and whatnot, but from individuals who just come by. There's one guy that comes by about once a month with the back of his car just loaded, and we have to roll carts out there to bring everything in. And we use that for our pantry distribution. We not only use it for a kitchen, there are actually churches and individuals who come and most of our evening meals are covered. They bring in a prepared meal and that's what we serve and then we use that for our uh, lunch the next day if there's any leftovers. But we do have to do some cooking. And so some of those items are for, for the mission, but most of it ends up going out to needy families in the community. And so uh, if you ever want to bring some canned goods by, we're always willing to accept those uh, or food. We use, uh, we try to get one or two pound packages of hamburger and that way we can put, depending on the family size, we can put one or two or in, in those for that. We give them some hamburger helper and tuna, tuna helper, canned chicken, canned vegetables. We really fix them up good. So that's, that's also a very important part of the, uh, the ministry that we do there. And again, we always include the gospel in that even if it's just a Bible and tracts in the box. And so I want to thank you for allowing me to come and share all this with you. And I hope you come by and visit sometimes. The door's always open. If you're ever in New York, just say, stop in and say, hey, Larry told me I can come by and give it to him. And if I'm not there, somebody else will take you around. And so we'd love to have you join us in that. Thank you very much. <laughs> As we come to our time of prayers, um, I would ask if there's anybody else you would like to lift up this time that's not maybe on the back. Oh, I guess it didn't turn it. Uh, we definitely want to remember Larry and all the men and women that are at the mission, those who work with the mission. Uh, I know that it takes a special servant's heart to go and to do that. So, if you bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you so much that you remind us um, through your word, through the scriptures that are just so poignant that your love will never let us go. And no matter the lies we've been told, no matter the paths we choose, no matter the roads we've taken, we're never worthless in your sight. We can never be separated from you, and we can never lose your love. We thank you for the gift of free will that you've given us, which has a double side. When we choose that free will, we can choose to walk away. We can choose to hang on to that sin and to carry it with us, or we can choose to place it at your feet and to take your yoke, which is easy. 
We thank you for places like Living Water and the Rescue Mission. We thank you for places that continue to share the gospel to those who are in need and who are hurting, who are in need of restoration and transformation and proof from all of the testimonies that I've heard from the years that you are still in the business of making one whole. Thank you for your son who came. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And thank you for the prayer that he has taught us to pray no matter where we find ourselves along life's journey, whether it's sitting in front of a, a mission door, whether it's sitting on the side of the road, sitting at the hospital bed of someone who is dying, or just when words have left our mouths. We thank you for the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we come to our time of offering, um, as Pat said at the FCC today, she used this time to focus on adapting. And I thought that was a good thing. We've learned to adapt a lot, haven't we, in a short amount of time? And one of those is with offering. We do have the plates in the back. But the attitude of offering is the same. No matter how we give, no matter how we do it. It's giving back to God the first fruits, that which he has given us in bountiful measures. So at this time, let's just take an attitude of gratitude as we sang in our first song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Because no matter what happens, God is still faithful. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we bring before your throne, before your feet, our offerings, that which we give back to you first because you gave to us before that. We ask that you would use those offerings, that you would bless them, that you would multiply them, that you would take the mission money that we give, just like to Living Waters and other missions, and you would multiply them to share the gospel, to touch hearts, to touch lives for your glory. We thank you for all of this. In your name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to sing, Jesus Loves Me, and we're going to sing it through two times. And we know this one by heart, but I want you to take this time, without your nose buried in a hymnal, to just focus on the words. And when we say me, it really means me.
doors today full of that love of Jesus, full of the hope, full of transformation, full of reconciliation, and full of resurrection. Now and forevermore. Amen. We're going to sing the family of God. I know it's in your hymnal, but we're going to sing the family of God because that's what we are. We are all one in him.